All right, welcome back. This is ACLS part two. We're not gonna do an intro because we're gonna just jump right into it. We covered in ACLS part one. If you haven't watched that, what are you doing? What am I doing? What do you mean what am I doing? I'm saying if you haven't watched that, what are you doing, audience? Oh, yeah. Like honestly. You just, picked, you just picked part two from the beginning? Idiots. Well, and, and you don't want a whole look at ACLS. You just wanna you only wanna solve bradycardia, tachycardia, strokes, and heart attacks. Just what if they die? Off. What if they die? Just knock it off. Stop it. Okay. Um so anyway, ACLS part two, we covered in ACLS part one. We I mean, covered, now that everybody's not listening anymore. <laughs> just kidding. We covered in ACLS part one, we covered ROSC and we covered cardiac arrest. Correct. That's it, right? Yes. Yeah. And so now we're going to be covering tachycardia, bradycardia, acute coronary syndromes, and strokes. The other four topics in ACLS. Mm -hmm. um, with a quick review, we will talk about EKG reading one more time real quick, and then we'll jump into stability identification. Because uh, that is an important part of kind of understanding ACLS. Because what happens is a lot of times these algorithms sort of split depending on the, if the patient is considered to be stable or unstable. So we'll yeah. chat on that. And defining stability and instability is very, very important. And, and we have a whole podcast on that. We do. We do. But in ACLS specifically, there are certain measurements and metrics and things that we look at to define whether someone's stable or unstable. Yes. And there's always, though, because obviously if you think about it, stability and instability – is somewhat subjective and not always just completely objective. There's objective parameters and then inevitably always one piece that's like, use your judgment. <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway. Okay, cool. So uh, let's jump back into it. Reminder on the EKG here. We look at basically five things when we're reading an EKG. The first thing we look at is the rate and the way to calculate that rate is to count the QRSs. This is going to be important because you're going to need to know if the rate is fast or slow to identify tachycardia or bradycardia, right? Mm -hmm. So first we look at the rate. Then we're going to look at the overall rhythm to see if it's regular or if it's irregular. So basically are those QRS points, so are those R waves lining up appropriately? Is the same distance in between two R waves? If there's not, then we know that the heart might be skipping a beat. Maybe it's beating too early or too late, and it's not beating in rhythm, in a solid rhythm. And maybe it's not coming from the right, maybe the electrical stimulation is not coming from the right place, right? Maybe it's not the SA node. It must be somewhere else and that type of thing. Or or maybe it's multiple places at once, like a PAC, a PJC. Mm -hmm. um, then we look at P waves to see if the sinus is responsible for uh, the, the SA node or the, the atria of the heart is responsible for beating that. Because if we see a positive P wave, we know that that is an atrial rhythm. If we see a negative P wave, we know that's a junctional rhythm. If we don't see a P wave, then it's either junctional or ventricular. Mm -hmm. And this is review. Then we're going to look at the QRS waves to see if they're wide or narrow. A wide QRS wave would be indicative of either a ventricular rhythm or something like a bundle branch block or something that's causing the stimulus in the ventricles to take more time depolarizing. And then lastly, we look at the ST segment. Um, and basically, we'll get to this with ACS, but this is identification of STEMIs or end STEMIs. Um, the ST segment can show us if we see elevation there, elevation of the J point, we will see that it gives us some evidence towards there's potentially a more serious heart attack happening. And we can talk about why that's more serious and physiologically what's the difference between an NSTEMI and a STEMI. And we'll get there. Um, so those are the five things, rate, rhythm, P waves, QRS, and then ST segment. If you read every EKG that way, from now until the end of time, you will be able to identify 99.9% .9 of all rhythms and weird things that can happen in your heart. So, And as, as an ER physician, there's actually like a sixth step, right? So I look at the rate, I look at the rhythm, I look at P waves, QRS waves, ST segment, and then I call cardiology. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I covered my butt. <laughs> I, so I will say, Chris and I spent some time in the ER together when I was in... Well, I mean, when I was in school and he was in the beginning of his residency, mm -hmm. and then when he was towards the end of his residency and I was transporting to him, we spent a lot of time in the ER together because I would I would transport over to him. But I remember like plenty of times I'd like ask EKG questions and stuff just about some like nuanced stuff. And I remember one time you being like, dude, let me just show you something. And you brought a stack of EKGs. Yep. And I swear to you, by normal standards, every single one of these was a STEMI. Right. It, it was there was ST elevation in terms of like there was ST elevation and we also knew that there was symptomatology that told us that there was chest pain and stuff like that. So it's a STEMI, textbook STEMI. And you were like, these are all the ones that cardiology sent back to us and said aren't actually STEMI. Yeah, right? right, right, right. So and we'll we'll talk about this in a little bit when we talk about ACS, but it's important to remember that STEMI is like a criteria of 
basically like flagging something for us to look deeper at. Just because someone has ST elevation on the monitor doesn't necessarily mean that they're definitely having a heart attack and physiologically that all adds up. It just in it increases our... It's another tool. It's another yeah. tool in your toolbox, right? So I feel like a lot of times, and I even felt this way coming up in, as, as a medical student, as a resident, even probably as an attending for a while, like that EKGs were something that you could read and completely diagnose from. And they're really not. They're, they're one other tool that you can use to increase your suspicion or decrease your suspicion for certain conditions. But it's one piece, right? You cannot take a piece of paper with scribbles on it and like diagnose, treat a patient, right? It is, it is a part of it. Just like you can't take one blood pressure reading or one heart rate or, you know what I mean? Like one blood, well, blood sugar measurement and, like and, and treat a whole patient, right? It is one thing you have to look at. And there is some art and science to it. And the art part of it is that sometimes, even though it looks a certain way, you look at the whole thing and you look at cardiology and, and five people think five different things and you go with the best you know, the best one you think. Is yeah. The only real definitive way that we know that someone's having a STEMI or a heart attack in general is being able to like look in there and see it. Right. <laughs> right? So right. It, it's similar to, you know, if you had, we know that when someone's having a PE, a lot of times they, their SpO2 saturation drops. That doesn't mean every patient that has a low SpO2 saturation is having a PE, right? right. So just another piece of data to help increase our suspicion for certain conditions. Right. And when it comes to STEMIs and you know, we'll talk about it with acute coronary syndromes, the purpose of the EKG is to help us figure out if we're going to go look or not, right? I mean, if we're going to actually do that cardiac cath and go look, because that in and of itself is an invasive procedure. So like, we don't want to do that necessarily on everybody. So how do we know who we should do it on? And like, again, one of the tools you have in your toolbox. You want to just talk about ACS first? <laughs> well, let's do that. <laughs> let's just do that. We've already kind of yeah. built it out. So I like it. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing that I want to add to that is, because I, I, I saw this all the time in the field, I see it all the time in the hospital, like do not let the end result affect how you've been, how, how you've learned to identify this stuff, 100%. Right? Because what happened all the time is the medics that worked with me would basically, if they saw a STEMI, they saw ST elevation on the monitor and the patient fit the criteria, they had chest pain, they, you know, maybe even they had a history for cardiac issues and they called a STEMI code. So they called and said, this is a you know code STEMI. This is a STEMI alert. Any time that that ended up not being confirmed by a, like a, like a, they go in to put a stent in and they confirm that it's not actually a STEMI that would disappoint the medics I worked with so much and they'd be so discouraged about it. And it was sort of like you're, you're I was wrong. Yeah. You're darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. Right. But like, it just that shit shouldn't happen. No, you weren't wrong. So this right. is the thing is that there is a difference between interpreting an EKG correctly and what that outcome becomes, right? So if you look at an EKG and it meets criteria for STEMI and you call a STEMI and a cardiologist down the line says, no, I disagree, or they don't, or they go to cath lab and there's no blockage there, you weren't wrong about that EKG, right? right? It's like looking at a heart rate and saying that's tachycardic. And then later someone's saying like, oh no, this patient doesn't need any treatment for that tachycardia. That's their baseline. You're not wrong that it was tachycardia. There are criteria for that, right? So, and we, that's something in medicine in general, we have to be super careful about is that letting the outlier outcomes change how we practice the basics of medicine, right? And I used to see this all the time. And there was um, a case specifically, where one, one of my attendings when I was in residency, I got an EKG it showed, I'm trying to remember exactly the case, but it was something where like the EKG showed some like tachycardia and the patient didn't meet criteria for like a PE, mm -hmm. but the attending was like, oh, but one time I had a patient who was tachycardic and they did have a PE. So now I scan every single person who's tachycardic. Yeah, like, like you can't do that. So that's like that. the other thing is the reverse is true too, because then you'll have, so you'll have some medics that won't call a STEMI ever because they're worried about calling a STEMI and being quote unquote wrong about right. the end result, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have some other medics that always call a STEMI because they figure, oh, I'll just catch it. You know what I mean? Why not? Even if it doesn't meet criteria. Stemi, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can't do that either, right? Because right. that harms the system. But What's really important here to fix these communication issues is to, if you work in the ER or you work in cardiology, you work in the hospital and you're interacting with the people that are responsible for, you know, calling the, the initial STEMI alert, even if it doesn't turn into a STEMI, you need to kind of give those people an attaboy of, 
hey, no, you did the right thing. You definitely, yes, they fit the criteria for it. It didn't end up being a thing, but this is why that criteria is in place. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel that way, then the criteria needs to change. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. And that's on yeah. you. You know what I mean? That, that's on the hospital and on the yeah. research system and what we're using to flag. But never discourage someone from using the you know, identification tools that you've instructed them to use right. to identify something, right? Exactly. So anyway, that's my that's my spiel about uh, identifying STEMIs. So just don't ever be afraid. If you think that it's a STEMI, call it and give that give that report, mm -hmm. right? And here's the thing too is you're sending the EKG to the hospital anyway, right? So they're going to get a look at it as well. So what well, you're well, you're not, you're not technically when you call a STEMI alert saying this person is having an ST elevated myocardial infarction. You're saying this person meets the criteria because I see ST elevation. So if you just say on in your report, I see ST elevation in 2 3 and AVF, that's all you got to do, right? They, and they same, can confirm that. Just same like, for me as an ER doctor too. I don't cath people. Right? So when a patient comes in and you show me that there's a STEMI and I look and I say, there's a STEMI and I activate the cath lab and I do all the things, if the cardiologist doesn't want to take that person to cath lab, well, that's on them. It doesn't change the fact that I need to activate that system because, you know what I mean? So, right. and unfortunately we do see that a lot. Yeah. And if you look at ACLS guidelines, and I don't believe this has changed anytime soon, but if you look at ACLS guidelines, technically any person who meets criteria should be cathed mm. every single time. Now the system doesn't work that way right. because- cardiologists get bad outcomes if they cast people who die on the table. There's a lot of like, like politics and also like just kind of like nuances there. But if you look at the actual guidelines, really like everybody should be cath if they meet criteria. Well, because the cath is not just the procedure of like stenting someone, it's the visualization of mm -hmm. the issue too. So right. they have to, the catheter is used to go in and look in the first place. Right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's break it down to basics a little bit and go real basic with what acute coronary syndromes are. So acute coronary syndromes, coronary is referring to the coronary arteries, the, the vessels that supply your heart with blood. Um, when we have an acute coronary syndrome, we basically have a lack of blood supply to the heart muscle itself, right? And this can be caused by a couple things. It can be caused by a narrowing of the vessels. Constriction. Yeah, so Not constriction. a blockage necessarily, just constriction yeah. of it. it, it and that, that constriction can be from spasm. That constriction can be from, you know, I have too much plaque buildup. The plaque doesn't even have to rupture. It just, the it swells, right? It can be from inflammation. It can be from, um, well, I guess Prince, Prince metals would be like a, mm -hmm. like a spasming. So, yeah. So the couple couple ways that it can constrict, right? It can be from a blockage completely, where maybe a piece of plaque breaks off and then then blocks it. Maybe becomes, which is an embolism, right? A piece of plaque, so a, a foreign entity, like breaking off, traveling to an area and causing a blockage. Right. Or it can be thrombotic, where it's just that plaque gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it just blocks that area, right? It doesn't break off and travel somewhere. It's just right there, but it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, it can be a a, a result from our clotting cascade in general. It, so it can be our attempt to stop a bleed. The clot becomes too big and basically scabs over and, and blocks that vessel. Um, and then you can also get acute coronary syndromes from things like bradycardia, right? If I'm if my heart mm -hmm. is beating too slow, I'm not getting enough oxygen to my heart to continue to beat. So there's lots of ways that you can have lack of oxygen to the heart. So yeah, so there's a couple different acute coronary syndromes, right? So there's and we, we define them based on what the mechanism is for that lack of oxygen to heart tissue, right? There is unstable angina. Well, I guess there's angina. So you, in recent years, have been saying angina, all right? And I, I don't always, like saying angina. Is it just because you don't like saying it? Because yeah. it can be pronounced either way, correct? I think it can be pronounced either I'm way. I don't like angina. saying angina. I like angina. I don't like... <laughs> I don't like no. I, I I wasn't trying to be. I wasn't even trying to be funny there. And I realize I'm hilarious all the time, but I I do like that pronouncing better. Angina to me sounds weird. Okay, well, you can have. Uh, how do you want to say it on the podcast? Then we got to pick one way to say. It. We're just going to confuse. I think we people. say angina. All right, fine. I don't like it though. So also, anyway, you can so have. Then if I take a clip from this and I say angina and I take a clip from that and I put it on TikTok, maybe TikTok reads that word wrong and then the views of that video goes up higher because people are searching things that are like angina. Mm. I honestly think that, so there's a, there's a TikTok that we had that has over half a million views. And I think it's just because I said the word nipple in the video because I was talking <laughs> about the nipple line. Yeah, probably. So I'm just saying, just keep saying to our strengths, yep. angina. All right. So anyway, so acute coronary syndromes, you have angina, you have unstable angina, you have STEMIs and you have n STEMIs. So ST elevation myocardial infarctions, and non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions, which are really one thing. It's myocardial infarction. Yeah. But again, there's like technically three, right? Or is there more than that? 
Those are the three that we typically define within acute coronary syndromes. I mean, you named four, unstable, stable. Well, I'm saying it's angina, seven. unstable angina, and myocardial okay. infarction. Yeah, essentially, when we're talking about ACS, we're talking about chest pain protocol. Yeah. Just chest pain protocol in right. general, right? So, but angina is basically lack of oxygen to the heart tissue that can cause symptoms, but it doesn't cause irreversible damage. Correct. It doesn't, no, no tissue dies. Right. Unstable angina is where that's happening, like even at rest. Which is so like angina is where you know maybe you exert yourself, you snort some cocaine, I don't know, whatever you're into, and you get chest pain symptoms, you get symptoms of lack of oxygen to the heart tissue, mm -hmm. but there's no reversible damage or there's no irreversible, irreversible damage, excuse me. Unstable angina is where you're getting those types of symptoms even at rest, which is a problem, right? Because it means that there's enough of a constriction or enough of a potential, you know, potential blockage that like we could be heading towards a more serious event if that's left untreated, yeah. right? You can stop snorting cocaine. You can't really like make your plaque smaller. You actually can. But that's so, a whole different story. So unstable but angina though, like at rest, stable when I'm running or I'm exercising or something like that, it's still a precursor to, uh oh, there's a lack of health here that we need to adjust. There's still acute coronary syndromes. It's obviously more at. serious if at rest when my heart rate is as slow as it can be and I'm as calm as possible. I don't have any adrenaline running through my system. I'm still hurting, right? And exactly. it's not going away. Right. So, and then myocardial infarction, and the key word there is infarct, infarcted tissue, dead tissue. So there's been enough of lack of oxygen to the heart tissue to call cause death of tissue, right? right? So it's the difference be, between ischemia and infarction, right. right? Ischemia is just the lack of oxygen. That's going to happen. And, and every myocardial infarction will start with mm -hmm. angina, right? Yeah. So first you'll have the ischemia, and you may or may not be symptomatic with it. Symptoms will start to develop as you have that lack of oxygen extend for a long period of time. And then eventually that heart tissue will start to die or infarct. And it'll die in a bullseye-like pattern based on where the blood is supplying, mm -hmm. right? So right in the area that the where the blood hits the most is what's going to start, you know, dying first. Right, right. So the other thing too is, and this is a, a, a generalization, but that's what we like to do here is back to basics kind of generalization so that we can wrap our minds around this stuff. Stable angina, right? to your point, I'm, I'm, I start running a marathon and, or I start just running across the street and all of a sudden I start having chest pain. We typically treat that with symptomatic treatment and lifestyle changes, right? You've clearly got plaque buildup or we do some tests to see if you have plaque buildup, right? And we say, okay, so we're going to change your diet. We're going to put you on antihypertensives, antiplatelet drugs, aspirin, things like that, right? To try to make that better. When we get to unstable angina, that's where like these are symptoms are happening at rest. I'm getting chest pain when I'm sitting watching TV. Those patients typically need a cath at some point. They may not need an emergent catheterization, but they probably need a catheterization in some type of stent because like we're not going to probably reverse that soon enough with the lifestyle changes and medications that we could. And a, and a stent or a, a cath is opening that vessel up. So mechanically going in and putting in like a, a mechanical mesh mm -hmm. to open, reopen up that vessel yeah. and expand it so that we can get better blood flow. Yep, exactly. And then myocardial infarction obviously needs a stent or a cath. Right? They, they, those, need, those need to be opened up more emergently because that tissue is dying and will continue to die if left untreated. Mm -hmm. Um super interesting actually and i don't think this is talked about enough so i'm gonna like sure. give a little side note here there have actually been studies and they think these were studies were done like in the 90s but like there have been studies of people who had cardiac cath confirmed plaque buildup in their vessels who went on plant-based diets mm -hmm. and then got recathed after i don't remember exactly how long but got recath after like a year or something like that and no longer had plaques yeah, which is kind of crazy. You, like you, act, plaque you can actually reverse plaque, but we don't talk about that enough. That's crazy. I didn't know that until I was like an attending physician. Mm -hmm. I thought like once you had plaque, like you, you kind of had that plaque and you just tried not to get more. Yeah, you, you can, can actually reverse it, which you is can crazy. unclog your arteries, essentially, right. which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is crazy. So, um, but who wants to? Yeah, not worth it. No, not guys aren't that expensive. <laughs> 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 so, um, so yeah, so that kind of describes the two conditions we're dealing with: ischemia or we're dealing with infarct. Uh, the thing is is in the field, if you're EMS or if you're noticing this um, on the nursing floor or anything like that, it's still going to be like a rapid call or a high priority patient. Um, like we have protocols on, on my nursing floor that if you have someone who has chest pain that doesn't go away with rest, that's like you're going to call for a rapid response. So you're going to have the uh, the RRT team come and, and examine that patient because it could be something very serious. There is no way symptoms-wise to determine whether or not someone is having an 
infarct or if they're just having the ischemia and the angina, right? So what we have to do is we have to treat all these patients the same in terms of our emergent immediate treatment. Mm -hmm. And that is where the Mona protocol comes in. Are we still using Mona across the board? Yeah, sometimes it's Fona. Sometimes it's basically you're going to be using a like analgesic with sure. oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. All right. So for the sake of this, let's talk about Mona, right? So Mona, M-O-N-A. You've got morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. And each of these is doing something a little bit different. And they're not done in that order, which is weird. We just try to make it sound cool like Mona. Like I guess that sounds more like a name. Mona Lisa, probably. I guess. I don't know. You know, Mona Lisa could have been, you know, I'm not even going to get into it. I, I read the Da Vinci Code series recently, <laughs> oh, yeah, so no. probably none of it's facts. No, but no, a lot of people a think lot of that it. Mona Lisa might have been a self-portrait of Da Vinci in drag. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that weird? I guess. Is it cool? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know really <laughs> how I feel, I feel about, about that. that. Yeah. I want someone to have caught Da Vinci doing a self-portrait in drag. Who like walked in and be like, what are you doing, bro? You know? Anyway. We di- we uh, something to think about. We digress. So Mona, so mo- morphine, oxygen, nitro, aspirin. We don't do them in that order. We start with oxygen, right? Oxygen. We have lack of oxygen in a tissue. What do we do? We're going to give them oxygen. Exactly. Pretty simple. And we're going to titrate. Chris and I always say titrate to ninety nine percent because that way you'll know if they decompensate faster. Correct. Right. That's all we're going to say on it. You can look up our other videos to figure, right. figure that one out. Aspirin. Aspirin. Aspirin is an antiplatelet. It is not a blood thinner. Correct. It prevents the platelets from being sticky, which means it's an antiplatelet. And therefore loosens up. It just prevents further it prevents plaque building. Further clotting. So yeah. it's not a clot busting medication. That's mm-hmm. called fibrinolytics, right? Mm-hmm. If we gave fibrinolytics or thrombolytics, then we would be busting a clot that's existing. The aspirin is just to make sure that now that the heart is under extra stress, that we're making the platelets a little less sticky so we don't propagate the current clot if it's a partial clot in a vessel, mm-hmm. and we're not going to have any more clots while the other vessels are under stress, right? Nitro. Nitroglycerin is a medication that expands coronary vessels. And we talked about this uh, recently. There's a TikTok that went out that was kind of big about Mm -hmm. nitroglycerin because I compared it to Viagra or Cialis. And there is truth to that. Viagra and Cialis were were both attempts to make a uh, a version of That's how we found nitroglycerin for chest pain is that people were trying to use medications to treat erectile dysfunction. It was a side effect. I thought it was opposite. I thought it was that people were trying to improve cardiac output. And then basically they're like, yeah, but I've had an erection for eight hours. What do I do? About Either it? way. Great find. Win-win. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. We talk about this. And when we talk about cardiac medications, just sort of different medications can target, they have the same mechanism of action, but they can target different areas. Right. So nitro Viagra and Cialis all have very similar mechanisms of action where they expand vessels, but nitro specifically works on the coronary arteries very well. So nitro expands that vessel. And that makes sense. We want to open that vessel up because it's, closed or it's narrowed or it's spasming, if we can open that up, we'll increase the amount of fluid or or blood getting to the heart and therefore the amount of oxygen getting to the heart. If we expand that vessel though, we need to also understand that relatively we're dropping blood pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of nuance and argument into, okay, well, if someone is hypotensive or if they have the potential to be hypotensive, depending on where blockage is in the heart, if I give nitro, could I technically bottom out their pressure by opening the vessels and reducing the amount of fluid because there's not enough fluid in the system, okay? So that is a consideration you need to make. Your protocols will dictate whether you use nitro in all STEMI cases, in all angina cases, or if there are certain, for instance, like right-sided MI, if, if you'll hold off on that. Uh, my recommendation is always just call for orders. If you have a right-sided MI, that's the one that has the potential of bottoming the pressure out. Just call your ER doc, your local ER doc and say, hey, I've got a right-sided MI. I'm suspecting a right-sided MI. Would you like me to withhold nitro? That's the safest way to do it. Yeah. I also feel like, and this is, again, follow your protocols, both in hospital and on the road, depending on what kind of provider you are. But there is also like an argument that like nitroglyc- nitroglycerin, if you're bradycardic, might not be a great idea either because mm. you already have a low heart rate. And then if you did like lower their blood pressure, do now you have like even more. I mean, yeah. again, follow your protocols for it. But yeah, um, 
So oxygen, aspirin, nitro, and then we would move on to an analgesic. So in the MONA protocol, we're referring to morphine. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you, you may use fentanyl, you may use other pain medication. The reason why morphine was for the longest time preferred is that morphine actually has some coronary vasodilation effects as well, just like nitro does. So it helps open up the vessels as well as take care of the pain. Now, why is taking care of the pain in a uh, acute coronary syndrome, besides just being nice, why is that important in terms of reversing an infarct or right. preventing an infarct? So the idea is that what are the things that are going to increase strain on the heart, right? Increasing your heart rate, increasing your blood pressure. These things are going to actually like potentially make things worse if you've got a blockage there. So what analgesics do is also is that they they calm you down, right? So they, they almost like de-stress you a little bit. They can take away the pain. So the pain is not a stressor anymore. Your body's more relaxed. So you don't have spikes in, you know, heart rate you don't have spikes in hey, oh my god see, see what that did there is chris's heart rate is wow. skyrocketing now because he's scared wow into kind of like a jeez uh, man some you know some thank god i don't have a black build up, up right? like, so he's ugh. scared his heart rate's up right which is why calming a patient down giving analgesics that will calm them and take away the pain Dude, is going to help i would like the fentanyl now. Gonna be no okay. i want fentanyl now it's gonna be okay no i want fentanyl so this is important for our audience to realize that That's calming a, a patient too. and being kind too. to a patient yep. and compassionate care goes a long way in truly saving lives because it lowers that workload on the heart. That was a great demonstration. Thank you. That was really scary. Sorry, you're the back of <laughs> it. And I'm sorry, Jamie, who's going to have to edit the sound so it doesn't like blow out the speakers. <laughs> so, okay, that is ACS, right? So that's how we're going to treat acute coronary syndromes in the meantime. We're going to run a 12-lead EKG, and we're going to see if we can identify ST elevation. If we see ST elevation, then we're going to go ahead and let them know the, uh, the hospital know, hey, they're having a STEMI as well. So this this be, this meets STEMI criteria. The difference between an end STEMI and a STEMI, so non-ST elevation versus ST elevation, is on the monitor, there's ST elevation, or there's not. In the body, what's happening is a complete blockage of a vessel will result in ST elevation. So that patient needs a cath because there's complete blockage in the vessel. If I have partial blockage in the vessel, that's an end STEMI, that patient can survive with blood thinners and thrombolytics, things to dissolve the clot, right? Now, some hospitals have cath labs and some don't. All hospitals have thrombolytics. Mm -hmm. So it might change your destination depending on if they have ST elevation as well, mm -hmm. right? So if I look at the hospital, I, I'm the same distance between a you know, hospital that has a cath lab and a hospital that doesn't have a cath lab, go to the cath lab hospital. That makes sense, right? If one's farther away, I need to see if Chris is having ST elevation. He's having ST elevation. Well, I'm going to actually bypass the, per protocol, bypass the hospital that just has the thrombolytics to go to the cath lab for an emergent cath. So this is, and this is going to raise questions like, well, wait, why don't we do thromb, if we do, and we're going to talk about stroke next. If we talk, if we do thrombolytics for stroke, why don't we do them for myocardial infarction? The reality is, is that I don't have a good answer for you because there's a lot of like conflicting literature as to like some, some literature has shown that like by giving thrombolytics in a myocardial infarction, you could increase the risk of like, like disrupting the fibrin clot and causing more thrombus or bleeding. But now there's actually research coming out saying that like, well, maybe we should reconsider that. Like one of the contraindications historically for not giving thrombolytics in stroke was a recent heart attack because they're worried about like, but well, we do but, give thrombolytics and stroke, so long as we do a stroke, we do a stroke. But why you not? We don't always for we don't always for myocardial infarction, gotcha, gotcha. and like why? And 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 what I'm what I'm just basically trying to paint the picture of is that like there is research on both ends to say maybe we should be, maybe we shouldn't be, you know. So that's why we're just we're not we haven't figured it out yet. I guess is my answer. And someone's gonna say like, yeah, we have, we absolutely should do it. I, I I mean, cool. I don't know. I've seen the research on both. If you look up the guidelines. There's still contraindications if you've had a recent MI to not give thrombolytics and stroke uh, when we're reconsidering that and some of the literature and stuff like that. So yeah. it's just worth noting. Cool. Yeah, bottom line though is that we do the ST elevation not to change our treatment in any way. We're still going to do Mona protocol in the field. You know, we do the S we do the identification of the 12 lead with the ST elevation to determine what destination we should go to because they may fit criteria for uh, a... I'm completely blanking. Uh, cat. Cardiac catheterization. <laughs> Cardiac catheterization. All right, that's ACS. We're 25% of the way done. We've been talking for way too long. Let's do stroke real quick because this is really easy right after that. Stroke's pretty easy. What's the difference between a stroke and a heart attack? Just the organ. Mm -hmm. Pretty much just the organ, right? right? We're dealing with the same thing, ischemia and or infarct in the brain. Now, ischemia in the brain will result in stroke-like symptoms, so neurological symptoms. 
but they go away. That's what, yeah, they, they're going to go away after a time because we can restore blood flow to that. Just that's like your chest would, pain does in angina. Exactly. Angina and uh, mini strokes or... Yeah, you got to be careful what terminology you use, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Angina and mini strokes are, are semi-synonymous in the sense that we're... And mini strokes is also like a term that like people don't like to use, yeah. so... But it's a transient ischemic attack is yeah, what we TIA, call it. right? A TIA. So a TIA is what... If your grandma says I had a mini stroke, she probably had a TIA. <laughs> so a TIA just means that there was temporary loss of blood flow to an area that showed ischemia, but it didn't result in infarct. And if your grandma and says I had a mini stroke, but she can't move the left side of her face, no, she didn't. She had her full stroke. Exactly. So, but right. But right. I mean, like honestly, like yeah. And, and what's so scary is, so I had a, a very good friend of mine recently had a stroke. That's right. Young guy uh, had a stroke, um, and it was because of a basically a not a defect, but basically like a congenital like shrinking of a vessel that feeds his brain. It's crazy. So it wasn't necessarily blockage and stuff like that. So when he went hypertensive, it gave him it gave him a stroke because the extra pressure on that that thinner vessel. But I remember just kind of like, we talk about this stuff all the time. He's a paramedic as well. But you're sitting in the hospital and it's like, did I have a TIA or did I have a stroke? And we're like, we don't know yet. We have to wait to see if it goes away. Yeah, like, right, right. If your, we, sim- if your symptoms don't go away. You haven't been able yeah. to get imaging yet or anything like that. And like, he didn't meet the criteria for some stuff. So it was like, we got to wait. And yeah. and that waiting can be pretty spooky, yeah. right? So, um, but yeah, TIAs versus a, a full stroke or a CVA, a cerebral vascular accident, is when we, a CVA is when we have true infarct of tissue. And that is irreversible brain damage, death of the brain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on what vessel, just like in a heart attack, depending on what vessel, we might see different things on the 12 lead EKG. Depending on what vessel, we'll see different things on an, a CT scan. And it's going to affect symptoms. So there are some areas that will do more weakness on one side of the body. There are other areas that will do vision or speech changes. And if you want a detailed view of all of those, you can check out our videos that are coming out very soon, sponsored by Medtronic. I don't remember what their name, they're, they're called. They're really long names. Stroke but The Stroke Medtronic alert. ones. Yep, check yep, those yep, out. Yep. So um, what's interesting with stroke is that it's, it's, there is certain criteria for treatments of stroke, right? So there's one, you have to identify them, right? So, and, and, Again, watch the stroke videos that we did because we really get into like what tools you use to, you know, quote unquote diagnose one, and then what tools you use to 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 put them on a scale to know if you should, you know, how big they are, how severe they are, severity scales. We won't go over that here, but basically what we do is the the most important thing is to identify when was the when was the onset of symptoms, right? If you went to bed fine and you woke up not fine, well, the onset of symptoms is some ter- somewhere in between there, right? So the last known well is, is what we use. The, nas- the last known well time would have been when you went to bed. If I'm sitting here talking to you and all of a sudden I develop symptoms, you look at your time, that, that my last known well was just a minute ago before I started having symptoms. And that's important because there's two things we look at in stroke. There are hemorrhagic strokes and there are ischemic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes is hemorrhage, bleeding in the brain. Ischemic strokes is lactic oxygen, just like a myocardial infarction. From a blockage or clotting right. or narrowing of the vessel. Yeah, something like that, right? If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, we're not giving fibrolytics, right? Well, we need, you know, because right. blood thinners, right? We're right. not going to give blood thinners or clot busters to someone who's actively bleeding out because right. if you cut yourself shaving and I give you a bunch of blood thinners, what's going to happen to that bleed? Right. It's, it's going to propagate, right? So the same thing happens in the brain. So yeah. our first and foremost priority right now as protocol stands, is to get the patient, if we identify stroke symptoms and we've ruled out stroke mimics, is to get the patient to a facility that has a CT scanner. Mm. We don't care how high up on the chain of stroke care hospitals that is. Get them to a CT scanner, any facility with a CT scanner. If we can get them there, because we need to confirm whether it's hemorrhagic or ischemic, and then we can consider things like thrombolytics or there's actually kind of a version of a catheterization for stroke mm-hmm. now for, for larger blockages in the brain um, called uh, thrombectomies where they can go in and they can pull the, the thrombus out, which is really yeah. cool. So very becoming more and more alike heart attacks and strokes. Are, you yeah. know, even in our treatment of them, they're becoming more and more alike. Right. But we're not going to do the Mona protocol with a stroke patient because – we're not trying to expand vessels in the heart, so the nitro and the morphine are pointless, right? Mm-hmm. There's no pain, so analgesics aren't going to help. We'll give them oxygen, sure, right. but we're not going to give them aspirin because aspirin's an antiplatelet, and if they're having a hemorrhagic, that might propagate the bleed. And, and this is that. where the like the question around fibrolinux in myocardial infarction comes into play. So even in strokes, we, we, we get a CT scan, we see that it's not a hemorrhagic stroke, we, we know then it must be ischemic, only if they're in a certain 
few hours window can we give fibrinolytics? Because if they're beyond that time, we worry about irreversible damage. And when tissue dies, it becomes friable and like fragile and can easily bleed. So that's why like in strokes, unless it's in that time, typically we won't give fibrinolytics or, th- or clot busting drugs if they're outside of that window. With myocardial infarction, unlike the brain, when, when you have lack of oxygen in your brain, you know it immediately. You develop symptoms. The heart's not really like that. So that's where it's really hard. Like as a doctor, I can't be like, oh, is this the first time you've ever had any symptoms of heart? Like you just threw a clot to your, no, oh, I probably had chest pain before. I, I know I have, you know, I know I have some plaque buildup. So like that's where like we just don't know a lot of times in terms of like that window. Stroke's easier because lack of oxygen in the brain, you see it right away symptomatically. Lack of oxygen to the heart, you develop symptoms, but it's really hard to say like, are, are these brand new symptoms? Or are they not? So that kind of goes back to the question of like why we definitely do fibrin- fibrinolytics and clot busting drugs in strokes within a window and why with myocardial infarction, we're still not sure if and when we should be using them. All right, so that covers ACS and strokes. Let's jump into our tachycardias and our bradycardias. Before we get into this, let's just briefly state how standardly ACLS would define instability because in these protocols, we're going to have a kind of a different algorithm for tachycardia that's unstable and tachycardia that's stable, bradycardia that's stable and bradycardia that's unstable. So how do we define stability? So the way we define stability when it comes to ACLS, right? And whether a patient's stable or not stable is we look at their vital signs and we look at their symptoms. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? So vital signs are going to be blood pressure, SpO2, heart rate, and then again, and then we go to symptoms. Yeah, and blood sugar, I guess you could say. Yeah, blood sugar you put in there. Symptoms, there's specific symptoms we're looking at, right? We're looking at symptoms for some of the things we already talked about. Do they have altered mental status or do they have signs of ischemia in like heart ischemia type of thing, right? Because really stroke and ACS are the things that we're like we're most concerned about. Yeah, because or anything. An unstable patient is someone who has lack of perfusion mm-hmm. to a major organ, right? And the major organs are the brain and the I almost said spinal cord. I'm very tired. The, the brain and the heart in this mm-hmm. case. So if you have chest pain, you're automatically unstable. Right. If you have altered mental status, you're automatically unstable. It's yep. not normal to be yep. not fully conscious and alert, right? Symptom-wise, the symptom that we tend to look at the most is blood pressure because it relates to systemic perfusion. Mm-hmm. So if you have a low blood pressure, you are considered in a lot of these algorithms to be an unstable patient. We define low blood pressure as anything below 90 systolic. Correct. Per ACLS guidelines. Again, like there can be arguments for other people being unstable at different parameters. We're not talking about that. We're talking about ACLS guidelines right now. And there's outliers all the time, right? If you're a ultra marathon runner, maybe you sit at a lower blood pressure all the time. And sure. that's, but we don't build algorithms based off of outliers. We build, build them out of the general population. If right. you have a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, you are considered unstable for these algorithms. We do not build, I like what you said there, we do not build algorithms based on outliers. We build them on a cohort of white 20-year-old men, (laughs) who, which is actually, I'm making jokes, but it's actually true. If you look at how we, back in the day, defined blood uh, heart rate between 60 and 100, is they actually just took a bunch of white dudes who were like 20s to 30s and took their average heart rates. Probably not the best way to figure out what the average is for like. So that's funny that you mentioned that is in scuba diving to figure out the dive tables for how long you're supposed to like decompress for and stuff. They used like young military men. And it's like, what a terrible, like, you know how many like not the body type of a young military man are scuba diving right now? And we're based off of their like. And and that's why you see so many 67 year old men who are out of shape who scuba dive having trouble issues. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. Um, but yeah, so just something to consider, like we, we do have to make some generalizations when it comes to defining stability. Otherwise it's not a def- definition, right? We have to, we have to be, we have to set it somewhere, right? So tachycardia is considered anything above a hundred beats per minute. That's another thing, right? You might be tachycardic right now because you drank some caffeine, but you are tachycardic. If you're above hundred beats per minute, there's gotta be a cutoff there. You're bradycardic. If you're below 60 beats per minute, mm-hmm. so 59 is bradycardic. 101 is tachycardic. 60 to 100 is what we would call so, normal cardiac or just a normal heart rate. And then so the question becomes, is that tachycardia or bradycardia unstable? And that's where we look at the blood pressure. I argue that we should look at, you know, look at the SpO2 as well, and we look at symptoms, right? And you can look at the situation, right? Yeah. If I just got done running and I'm sitting there with a heart rate of 160, 
that's not normal heart rate for someone my age or me normally, but you know that I was just running. So, right. so you're not going to panic about a heart rate of 160, right? You have to take all these things into consideration. But, and it's where reassessment becomes a key piece too, right? You don't just take one measurement and then base everything off of that, you, right? You're, you're continuing to check vital signs and things as you move forward. So in the ACLS algorithm, to keep it simple, keep, bring it back to basics, we're talking about tachycardia and bradycardia, the algorithms, right? Tachycardia, bradycardia, we had to decide, is it stable or unstable? And the way we do that is by looking at their blood pressure. So let's start with stable, okay? So if I am bradycardic, we'll start with slow heart rates. If I'm bradycardic and I'm stable, so I don't have any, I don't have symptomatic bradycardia. I'm and not no symptomatic chest pain, right now. No, no chest pain. Status. I'm stable and I'm bradycardic. Do nothing. Well, right. Do nothing. First of all, like, how'd you end up in this situation in the first place where you even know? <laughs> you right. know what I mean? But yeah, there, there's no, no danger in being bradycardic. If you're, you might want to investigate it. Right. You might want to look into it. Right. Well, so like I, I'm a long distance runner and I, I will average a resting heart rate in the forties. Yeah. Um, that in someone who's. 80 years old and isn't a runner, that's a concerning bradycardia. And if they don't have symptoms, maybe you need to look harder to see if they have symptoms. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything in consideration. That's where you bring in that provider judgment, right? But if someone is stable and bradycardic, what you want to do is you might still want to bring them in for evaluation or have them follow up with their primary care physician, but there's nothing emergent right now to stabilize, right? right? They're already stable. We don't need to stabilize. ACLS is about stabilization, right? It's not about long-term treatment. It's about stabilization, right? So we're not really going to do anything with bradycardia that's stable. With bradycardia that's unstable, so I'm symptomatic now. Maybe I feel woozy or I'm dizzy or I have an altered mental status or I have chest pain or, you know, anything like that, right? Um, we're going to speed up their heart, right? right? So there are two ways that we can speed up their heart. We can do it pharmacologically and we can do it with electricity, mm -hmm. right? So we can use our monitors uh, to put AED-like pads on the patient and pace the patient, where we basically electri electrically stimulate the heart at a rate that we choose, and we typically choose 60 beats per minute to get the heart to beat at 60 beats per minute. It's going to shock the heart. Every time it shocks the heart, the heart beats, and they're going to be jumping up and down kind of a little mm -hmm. bit. Their, their chest is going to be jumping up and down, and we're going to speed their heart rate up by introducing electricity to it, right? Correct. And that is what we would call transcutaneous pacing or TCP. Mm -hmm. So transcutaneous pacing should be done on any unstable bradycardic patient. What we can also do and we should also do is give them a medication that can speed up their heart as well. Right. And the medication that we typically choose in ACLS protocol is called atropine. A approved dosage of atropine is going to work as a chronotropic to speed the heart rate up. Right. So we're going to give them that medication. Now there's not a big concern about all of a sudden making someone tachycardic with these types of treatments, especially if you're doing transcutaneous pacing. Because if right. I'm pacing someone, their heart rate can't go faster than what I'm pacing them at. So there's no concern. Like there was a case that we reviewed on another podcast that mm -hmm. we talked about. Like there's not really any concern with transcutaneous pacing. They're not all of a sudden going to be paced at 120 or going tachycardic. Right. Um while when you're using pharmacological means to speed someone's heart rate up, we can't cap what that heart rate is. Right. You know? So so that's where the, the Edison before medicine is what we say a lot of times in terms of priority of treatment for unstable patients. Using electrical treatments tend to be a more effective and safer way to treat the patient. Now, the problem you may run into with bradycardia and trying to use transcutaneous pacing is that if the patient's very awake and alert, it can be uncomfortable, right? You're, you're literally shocking them through their skin to get their heart rate going. So maybe you need to give them some sedation or something to relax them. Well, you got to be careful there too, right? Because you don't want to like have that relax them so much that their heart rate goes down because they're already bradycardic. Right. So like, there, so like, yes, you can try a dose of atropine or two. It's pretty quick most of the time to put an IV in, give a dose of atropine, see if it works while you're hooking things up. But if you have a patient who continues to be bradycardic, despite your pharmacological treatments, you have to go to transcutaneous pacing per, per the, yeah. like you have to do something to bring that heart rate up. Well, and that, that's, that's a big argument in EMS right now is that I think EMS providers get a little bit confused about, okay, they're unstable bradycardic. I'll start them with atropine and then I'll move on to transcutaneous if I get really worried. And it's like, no, no, they're unstable. If they're unstable, hook up the pacer. Right. You're not going to harm somebody with the pacer. You can make them uncomfortable, but you're not going to harm them. Right. And if you get that capture first and then you go ahead and follow up with some sedation or some pain meds or something like that there's no danger of that heart rate dropping because right. you have good capture right so 
nothing wrong with that. You've made a lot of arguments in the past for if you plan on intravenously, if you plan on inserting a pacer to someone in the hospital, if you're going to put so, a yeah. pacemaker so in. So in the emergency department, if I come in, and some, if someone comes in and they are bradycardic and they are unstable, there there have historically been arguments to put in a uh, transvenous pacer. And that's essentially where I go into the internal jugular vein, run a catheter down into the atria, try to capture electric activity with that, with that node, and then pace the heart literally like inside, right? But what, what I've seen done so many, so many times as I've come up in medical school and residency and as an attending is that residents or, or attending physicians, emergency physicians will, will work on floating a transvenous pacer and not have started transcutaneous pacing. And my argument is, is that if you think the patient is in such dire straits that they need transvenous pacing, that you need to go drape them, sterile technique, put a big catheter into their internal jugular vein, go down, then you should be transcutaneously pacing them, right? Meantime, And then the question is, if you can transcutaneously pace them and get capture, they probably should just go to the cath lab to get a permanent pace, not the, you know what I mean? So like, 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 and like, there are arguments back and forth on that, but I'm just saying like, Think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. If I r- truly think a patient needs a transvenous pacer in the ER, the way I do it now, if I truly feel that's the case, then I have to transcutaneously pace them first. It's it's like, it's to me, it's very similar to saying this patient needs to be intubated, but I'm not going to bag them until it's time to intubate them. Yeah, right? exactly. It, do, it exactly. doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Like, you have to have that kind of transitional treatment 100%. Um, if it's important. So, so that's bradycardia. Essentially, uh, well, so what, one thing... No, no, that's it. I'm mixing it up. Yeah. So there's there's um, there's, there's for, other chronotropics yeah. that you can give as a second consideration. So you can, uh, if those treatments aren't working, you can move on to more of like a catecholamine drip to speed up the heart. You could do like an epi or a dopamine and use its chronotropic effects to speed up. So you could do like a basically a catecholamine drip where we're doing a drip rate of epinephrine to speed the heart up and, and do it that way. Those are a little bit more long term if we're talking EMS. Um, but typically transcutaneous pacing, if you can get capture, that's going to do it for you and you're going to be good to go. So you can consider push dose too. I mean, like they're, they're like, it, that's not an ACLS guideline. So that's I'm, what we're shifting to a lot right now. Yeah. Is, yeah. So you, push it's, dose epi. it's not currently in ACLS guidelines, but you can do push dose epinephrine to just keep the heart rate up while you're trying to get atropine working, while you're trying to get transcutaneous pacing working, while you're trying to transport so they can go to cath lab for a pacer or things like that. And then tachycardia. So if we are stable but tachycardic, there's a couple things that we can do to try to non-invasively slow the heart rate down. And the first thing that we would consider you know we would be... We didn't, we didn't mention, though? We need to go back to bradycardia, vagal maneuvers. No, that's tachycardia. I'm about to say it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I perfect. did the same thing, though, Excellent. because the way I have it listed on here is... Yeah, 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 okay, so, okay, perfect. So, yes, so a non-invasive way that we can slow the heart rate down is vagal maneuvers. Vagal maneuvers are essentially... Um, activating the vagus nerve, so activating the parasympathetic nervous system in your body uh, through natural means. So one way that your body activates its parasympathetic nervous system is when you're pooping. So if you bear down, you you flex the muscles that you would when you poop, uh, that will actually lower your heart rate and kind of slow down your metabolism. It'll it'll work on the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. So we can ask people to do that. Hey, I need you to bear down. And you might need to explain what bearing down is because some people don't know. It's also important to tell them not to actually poop. <laughs> sure. I've had that happen where yeah. I'm like, you need to kind of like flex like you're going to poop and then the patients just poop themselves. Right. right. But you know what? A small price to pay in order to get your heart rate down. This was a large price. <laughs> 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 so anyway, another thing you can do, so I've seen this where you like, have them like blow into like a, a straw, but like that's capped. Yes. Right. So that's like blowing against something that like, they can't, you know, like that was the same thing, right? So it's a version of bearing down, but it's something maybe easier for them to understand like yeah. blowing into that closed. They, they've they actually been doing this technique in ERs lately where they have someone blow through a straw and then they swoop their legs at the same time and they like give them make that like, like fall. They like, yeah, make them have the feeling of falling. So they like do this whole weird thing and then that's supposed to be like really effective. But it's always been funny to me because it's like, how did they come about discovery that like how many weird things did yeah, they do yeah, yeah, first yeah. you know but there's a couple other ways to activate um cold compresses on the back of the neck and things like that work great um and if you think about it think about like when you like when you like jump into a cold pool and you're like you know that kind of like yeah. that's the vague that is that right that's that vagus nerve being like stimulated so like with children or babies too like you you don't can't tell them how to bear down so you take like a cold bag of saline or like ice and like put it on their face and just kind of get them to like that shock get that yeah. kind of that shock feeling yeah yep um something that 
you may have heard of before that we no longer do is a carotid massage. So we do not do carotid massages anymore because what would happen is when we massage that area, though it can activate the vagus nerve, it also can like grind up plaques that we have in there and like potentially those plaques could then break off and go up into the brain and give us strokes and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we stay away from carotid That would be the worst. <laughs> that, would be, that would be the worst. Yes. You're like symptomatically bradycardic and then stroke out. Don't do carotid massage. We don't do it anymore. Cool. So that's the, your non-invasive means. Then you would move on to if they're still, you know, this was, if they're symptomatic but they're stable. You know, it kind of all depends on what you're dealing with. But if you want to move on to further treatments, you can consider pharmacological inter- intervention. And I'll say for unstable tachycardia, like the blood pressure's off, they're symptomatic. Like, yes, you can still try vagal maneuvers while you're getting the other things ready, right? You shouldn't not, you shouldn't forego pharmacological treatments in unstable tachycardia to do vagal maneuvers. But as you can see, like, it's pretty simple to do vagal maneuvers. You can do that quickly while someone's establishing IV access. You know what I mean? So, so the next thing that we would move on to with stable or unstable is we can consider pharmacological measures, which would be adenosine. Now, remember, with unstable treatment, we do have that that kind of rhyme, edison before medicine, where we're, we're always going to consider the more effective treatment of electrical um, intervention. And the electrical intervention is cardioversion, which we'll talk about in a second. But I just want to talk about the pharmacological that can happen, you know, as a non-responsive to vagal maneuvers, so we want to move on to um, adenosine, or they were, were already cardioverting, and we also want to add pharmacological interventions to it. I guess is what I'm getting at. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Because people get confused. They think like, oh, pharmacological is for stable. Well, if you're stable tachycardic, you don't always have to like. You, you don't always have to bring the heart maneuvers, and then you can just yeah, you can just consider like you can just monitor them and keep them. Keep them comfortable right. and, and have an expert review and take them to the hospital. Right. And, and like if I have somebody who comes in who's tachycardic at 200 beats per minute and they're stable and it's like AFib, I'm not giving them adenosine. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to other medications that are approved for that condition. You know what I mean? So like – I would argue that if you're 200 beats per minute, well, you're probably unstable. You're probably in VTAC and there's no way you're stable. Right. <laughs> so is it worth talking about identifying the complex the first – yeah, so you do – I don't know if it is because the, the algorithm doesn't really change. Sure. Tachycardia is tachycardia, and we're really concentrating more on stability. There are some medications that are better for wide complex tachycardias than um, adenosine, which is what we're talking about now, would, would be. Um, and if you have like an irregular rhythm, you typically want to stay away from adenosine. Um, adenosine works on the junction of the heart. So essentially it's going to stop it's going to slow down the impulse right at the AV node. So if you're generating a heart rate below the AV node like a ventricular rhythm, adenosine won't work on it anyway. Right. So there is um, if you look at the ACLS algorithm, there's technically like two tachycardic. There's narrow complex tachycardia and there's wide complex tachycardia. And I think as we're trying to bring it back to basics, we're talking about addressing the unstable patient in general with pharmacology and electrical. But if you have a narrow complex tachycardia, we sometimes define that as like an SVT. That's where we would try adenosine because adenosine works at the junction and we know that if it's narrow, it's coming from above the junction. But with a wide complex tachycardia, adenosine is not going to do anything. So we can skip adenosine and go right to the electrical. And that's where like AFib with RVR and things like that, some some of these irregular rhythms, that, that's why it's so important. The second thing we do is we look for regularity because we need to figure out is our heart rate just fast or is our heart rate fast and irregular? Because if it's fast and irregular, then we want to consider medications like antidysrhythmics. So that would be like things like amiodarone, lidocaine, things like that, mm-hmm. um, which we talked about a little bit in the cardiac arrest treatment stuff. So amiodarone is kind of your go-to for, right now at least, for irregular heart rates um, when traditional treatments aren't fixing it. But just talking about adenosine, yes, this is mostly for supraventricular tachycardias, so tachycardias that are generated above the AV node or at the AV node. Um, and what it does is it, it slows down the heart. So it, it captures that impulse and holds that impulse there, doesn't let it go into the ventricles for a little bit, and slows down that heart rate. It works on the AV node. Adenosine works directly on the AV node. So that's why it's only effective in supraventricular tachycardias. Yes. Um, in terms of giving adenosine, it needs to be given very quickly. Um, so we typically will follow this. We'll, we'll do this IV push, rapid IV push, and we'll follow with a flush. Um, and we'll usually pinch off the line as we push it so that there's nothing in between. It's just that that full bolus of medication. It has a half-life of like 
six seconds or something like that. But you have to let your patient know they're going to feel like garbage yeah. for like um, a couple seconds so if I'm, there. If, yeah, if I force your heart to all of a sudden stop for a second and really slow down, you'll see actually see these patients sometimes flatline for a period of time on the monitor, just a couple seconds, but they're going to feel that too and their body's going to start going, oh, something's yeah, wrong. Like, there's right? like an so, impending doom type of thing. Like why is it like, you've yeah. stopped your heart for a so second? So let them know they're going to feel kind of lousy and make sure you push it rapidly. Um Moving on to electrical, cardioversion is what we'll do for tachycardias. If they're unstable and they're tachycardic, I recommend cardioversion right off the bat. You can yeah. do this at the same time as adenosine. You can do it before adenosine if yeah. you want. If it's SVT and it's unstable, like their blood pressure is low, they're symptomatic, they're altimetric status, cardiovert them, yeah. right? Yes, you can try adenosine as, as you're getting ready for cardioversion if you'd like. Wide complex tachycardias, ignore adenosine. If they're unstable, you go right Cardio. to cardioversion. Yeah. So cardioversion is basically a... Uh, it is not a defibrillation. It's a synchronized shock to the heart. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is we have to program the monitor to basically mark the R waves so that we're shocking at a very specific time. So you'll see little arrows pop above the R wave when you sync a wave. And then you go ahead and give synchronized cardioversion where you shock the heart. If we don't synchronize, it's essentially shooting without aiming. And if we do that, there's a potential that we can shock them during the refractory period of their heart's electrical activity, which is the time that the heart is resetting to be able to depolarize again. And if we shock someone during that time, we can potentially put them into very dangerous rhythms. So it is very important that you just do one As thing. As in like asystole. Yeah. <laughs> well, or yeah, or right. V-fib, right. right? So you can make them pulseless. You can kill them by shocking them on the wrong spot. All you got to do is remember to hit the sync button. Just hit that sync button and you're good to go. And then we usually shock in stackable dosages. So we can we start at a, a manufacturer recommended dose and then sometimes that goes higher and higher. Uh, you always shocked at kind of a standard dose. You usually stayed pretty high when you were in the ER. So but and I did this protocol. Yeah, I did this for a reason. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the ACLS algorithm itself calls for a range of what is it? It's uh, it depends on the monitor actually, but yeah. like. 100 then 200 then like if it's if it's a standard shocking stackable dose would be like 100 200 and then 400 300 and then max you can't shock at 400 a lot of them max out at like 360 okay but i think if you look at the acls guidelines it says that like you can start at 100 and if that doesn't work go to 200 yeah i just always did 200 yeah i usually got to sedate someone for this anyway right i mean you're not gonna sh you can't like cardio for somebody who's awake i mean you you can and if you have to you need to yeah i always try to sedate them give them something right you know, a lot of times, even you give them something, they wake up, they're like, holy, you know what I mean? Like, it's a, you're shocking them hard. But like, if there's a chance I'm going to have to do it a second time at a higher dose, it was just easier just to do it at 200 to begin yeah. with. And you have that prerogative because you can practice medicine. Yeah, don't but EMS providers right. and nurses on our RT teams that are following protocols. Start at 100. You got to do the manufacturer rec recommendations and it's probably going to be stackable doses unless a doctor there's orders. There's actually it. arguments now and research that shows that you can like double stack them. So like literally like hook up two different monitors and shock them by the same time with both. What? Yeah, I don't That's know. Weird, weird stuff. Um, interesting. But that is how you would cardiovert someone. So Chris mentioned the sedation thing. You may not have sedation protocols. Yeah. Um, pain meds are fine. It's it's a one time shock though, so a pain med's not going to be really if a helpful. Patient is unstable. It is more important to try to make them stable than it is to make them comfortable, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Like for them. <laughs> but like honestly, anytime like, that I have cardioverted, there has been no sedation. Because if I'm cardioverting, I'm in the back of an ambulance and I feel like the patient's severely. Well, and if they're truly unstable, if they're truly so unstable, shot. like they're probably altered anyway a little bit. Like, I mean, like hopefully they don't remember. Or if they do, they're alive to remember. So, all right. So that covers brief review of EKG interpretation, stability identification, ACS, stroke tachycardia and bradycardia and that brings us to the end of our review of acls so i will say the one thing too for these tachycardia and bradycardia algorithms of if at any time the patient becomes pulseless you change over to the cardiac arrest algorithms yeah so that's a worth mentioning right these aren't like hey he's having exclusive. chest pain so he's in this box of acs protocol right like you can be tachycardic and because you're unstable tachycardic it's causing chest pain so it is up to you as the provider to kind of figure out what algorithm you're going to be at what time, right? And there can be a lot of, okay, is he having a heart attack and that's thrown off his electrical rhythm now? So he's bradycardic because of that. What is the underlying cause? And that's only going to happen through good assessment, history taking, understanding your situation and knowing your stuff. It's not going to happen from a deep study of the algorithm. Right. You also can operate in two algorithms at the same time. 
and I'll just make a note of this, and I won't reference anything, but if you have a patient who is bradycardic and having severe chest pain, and you think that they may be having a myocardial infarction, you can treat their bradycardia and should treat their bradycardia because they are unstable. They're having chest pain. That is unstable bradycardia, as well as give them aspirin and nitro. And, or, or, you know what I mean? You can do that and should. I, I would also say something that I would see all the time when teaching ACLS is it, it's a very common ACLS uh, test, like one of, the, one of the scenarios where you have a patient that is in ROSC. So they were in cardiac arrest, mm. and then we return to spontaneous circulation, and their heart rate's real slow. And the first thing that people do is like, okay, their heart rate's slow. I got to get that up. I'll go ahead and give atropine. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, wait, I, I would consider this patient to be pretty unstable since they were dead 30 seconds ago, right? right? right. We can, and there's already pads on them because we've been shocking them. Right. Pace them. Just pace right. them in yeah. ROSC, right? For get sure. Get their heart rate up by pacing. It makes way more sense. Yeah, so. absolutely. Also, like that med's not going to circulate very well if- you just got ROSC. They just, yeah, they were dead. Yeah. Um, something to think about. Cool. That is going to end our episodes on ACLS. If you want a CE credit for this, go check out guardiancme.com and we'll see you next time. Stay sweet. Hey guys, thanks so much for taking a listen. Uh, If you are studying for the National Registry exam, we're here to help. We have a National Registry prep program uh, to help you pass that exam. Check us out at guardiantestprep.com. If you'd like continuing education credits uh, for listening to our podcast or watching this on YouTube, Follow us at guardiancme.com, 100% free CAPSI credits. Uh, No matter what state or country you're in, uh, we're here to help. So again, we thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful week.